okay, so we've seen that optimal transport can, well, that it can be formulated as a linear program, that it can be solved by network flow problem, but that this linear programming formulation also has, you know, it is the exact thing. Um, it is, it gives us the best solution for the problem that we're asking, but sometimes we're not so sure about which problem we should be asking. Yeah? The, um, the costs of transporting things from somewhere to somewhere, if estimated by neural network, the costs themselves are not completely reliable. And so perhaps we will be fine with an approximate solution uh, if it is much, much faster. If in addition, it is differentiable and has other nice properties. And uh, this is a strategy giving you all of that is what I want to um, discuss now, uh, namely discrete optimal transport using Sinkhorn iterations. Uh, Sinkhorn iterations have been known since at least the 60s um, and they were you know, picked up repeatedly in machine learning. But uh, this is the paper that I'm referring to in particular, which you know, focused on it or brought attention to it again in the context of optimal transport. All right, here is a reminder of what we said at the end of, of, of the last lecture. And one way forward here is to use entropic regularization. Um, what does that mean? Um, it is perhaps best explained by this picture here, um, taken from this book of uh, Perret and uh, Couturi. So let's say that um, we have a triangular feasible region here. We're looking for the sweetest spot in this permissible region to solve a linear program. The linear program has a cost vector like so. And well, the sweetest spot given this feasible region and given this cost vector is this corner of the polytope. Remember, solutions are always at a corner of a polytope or at most on a face of a, of a polytope. Um, you also see color coded um, the cost where here red is better and blue is worse. Now one can add a little bit of negative entropy or a lot of it <laughs> as a uh, as a regularizer. And when you do, well, you add this uh, P log P term to the originally linear objective and you get a mixed objective function uh, like so. And uh, this mixed objective function will have an optimum which no longer lies on a corner of your polyhedron. So you remember that if the cost vector, um, if it pointed here, we found this corner as optimal solution. If the cost vector pointed there, we would have found that corner as an optimal solution. And uh, well, if we add the entropic regularization, then um, under the blue vector, um, we will find this solution. And under the green cost vector, we will find that solution. Yeah? So practically the same or almost the same solution, or let's say as we change the cost vector, the solution uh, changes smoothly and does not you know, suddenly jump from one corner to another corner. And that is desirable if we want to be able to end-to-end -end train such systems. Um, a disadvantage is that um, if you think of the corners of this polyhedron, uh, meaning that um, there is or is not flow um, or assignment, or let's say flow between a source element and a sink element, um, if we have a solution in the inside of, uh, of this polytope, uh, it means 
that we get really dense solutions out. So what do I mean by that? In the optimal solution, we saw one. So for these source and target distributions and for that transport cost matrix shown on the right, um, the resulting optimal solution was the transport plan shown on the left. And uh, well, the most striking thing is that actually most of the elements in the transport plan are zero. Or in other words, uh, we looked at this dark blue element here before. Um, the dark blue element, uh, some of it went here, um, excuse me, some of it went to the second bin and some of it went to the fourth bin and uh, none of it went anywhere else, exactly none of it. If we now use this entropy regularization, uh, well, we will push a little bit of it over here and a little bit over there and a little bit over there. So we will get a much smoother solutions where each source bin contributes to every target bin. And well, this can be a problem and uh, depending on what you want, which is why I'm mentioning it here explicitly. Um, why is that so? Um, I've here shown you a one-dimensional example. So let's say that uh, here is my uh, feasible region. Let's say the feasible region is given by everything to the right of the zero. That would be my feasible region. And in this one-dimensional optimization problem, um, my cost vector is just a scalar number. It, uh, it says that the further right I go, the higher the cost. Um, so my linear programming solution in this case would be at zero, yeah? because I want to make the cost as low as possible, but I cannot go to the left of zero. So my linear programming solution here would be at zero. If I now add a little bit of negative entropy, um, so P log P, uh, which is the green curve that I've shown there at the bottom, then this curve will have an infinite slope at the origin. Uh, that means if we make an infinitesimally step away to, from zero in the positive direction, the gain from the regularization term, because it has an infinite negative slope, will be much larger than the increase in cost. And the result is that uh, my optimum solution will move away from the boundary. So in fact here, if my cost vector has a slope of plus one, uh, then I would uh, look for the place where the, the cost and the regularization, they balance each other which would be at the point where uh, this has a slope of minus one. So probably the optimum solution would be uh, no longer at zero, but round about here. And this was a one dimensional example, but the same holds in higher dimensions. Okay, so if you look at the black thing, it is just the linear programming formulation of optimal transport that we saw before. Uh, again, P was the matrix uh, describing the transportation plan. C was the matrix describing the cost vector. And uh, we now add to it this green term. And the main thing you see here is P log P, uh, you know, uh, negative entropy. Um, there is a user choice or, you know, this factor gamma. Uh, which the user needs to determine how big do we want to make this contribution. And um, there is a minus one in there, uh, which is in there just to make the math uh, nicer. Okay. Um, as you will see in a moment. So to solve this kind of optimization problem, um, one way forward is to formulate the Lagrangian. So the Lagrangian um, depends on my original variable that I want to optimize over, but also on Lagrange multiplier, here vectors of Lagrange multipliers alpha and beta. And in this Lagrangian, 
um, I have copied down the objective function. And then there are these extra terms, Lagrange multiplier times constraint. Yeah? So the P times one uh, should be A. Um, so here this one is again the, uh, the vector filled with ones. Um, this was the normalization constraint that our transport plan should transport everything away from A and it should bring everything we need to B. And uh, these constraints are now no longer constraints but are added to the objective in the Lacrangian. Um, and uh, then you differentiate this Lagrangian with respect to the variable that we want to optimize over. And I'm now going over this just quickly because I still want to talk about Wasserstein guns later today. You can study this in more detail. But um, you know, the, this funny minus one that you saw earlier in the objective, it nicely cancels. And uh, you are left with this. And if you exponentiate, you find that the optimal transport plan is given by a product of three things, uh, namely an exponentiated um, negative Lagrange multiplier, where we again have in the denominator this gamma. Um, so something like uh, temperature. Yeah? Um, we have the exponentiated element of the cost matrix and the other Lagrange multiplier. And we can just um, say that this is an element of a vector u, this is an element of a vector v, and this matrix here, we call it a kernel matrix, element of a kernel matrix k. And so overall, um, this is a true statement. Um, the trouble being that well, it depends on these Lagrange multipliers, alpha and beta, which we do not know. Um, <laughs> and now, uh, you know, what, what happens is the Münchhausen thing, um, the thing you don't know, you guess it somehow, um, you plug it in, and uh, you get a, a new update from which you improve your estimate of alpha and beta or the exponentiated versions, and you iterate. Okay, this is the basic story. Um, so here in more detail, um, these were the normalization constraints. Um, so we know that P times one should be A and P transpose one should be B. And writing it uh, in uh, terms of vector matrix products, uh, it is this where this funny notation here means um, this is an element-wise product. Yeah? So k was a matrix, v was a vector, so the entire thing is a vector, u was also a vector, and so I'm here taking the element-wise product of the vector on the left and of the vector on the right. And um, now solving this respect, with respect to u, which involved the Lagrange multipliers alpha, we get something which, so a is known, this is the stuff we wanted to transport away. B is known. This is the stuff where we wanted to stuff to end up. K is known as the exponentiated um, cost matrix. And the V and U are unknown. And you see that the update equation for U depends on V and the update equation for V depends on U. And uh, you can now iterate this and you will find a stationary point. And uh, overall, uh, this gives you a very fast algorithm. So um, here from this paper that I cited earlier, um, we see how much stuff you want to transport away uh, and want to uh, transport somewhere. So uh, the biggest thing here is histograms with uh, 4,000 items or bins. And uh, the execution time here is uh, logarithmic. So you can see that this is something like, you know, three orders of magnitude faster than a previous algorithm, which already was, was, not, uh, you know, was not bad. 
And uh, because these are all matrix vector operations, they are very GPU friendly. So if you do it on GPU, um, you are about an order of magnitude faster than if you do this on, on CPU. Now, there was this uh, fudge factor gamma, you know, which looked a little bit like a temperature. And here you see its effect. Um, if you uh, let the temperature go towards zero, you approximate the exact solution. So shown here, by the way, you know, what is this diagram? Um, this is the stuff, this is our source, this is our sink, and this P is our transport plan. Um, so where stuff goes. And uh, in the one-dimensional case here for these absolutely continuous distributions, um, the optimal transport plan would really be zero outside a, uh, you know, this curve here. And so the one extreme, if you let gamma go to zero, is you approach the exact solution. The other extreme, if you let gamma go to infinity, um, well, this thing here is just the outer product of the two limiting distributions. Um, this is always a valid transport plan. Yeah? So if, if somebody <laughs> asks you to come up with a valid transport plan, you know, without doing any math, there's always this solution, which just means, <laughs> well, you know, it's a stupid solution. But uh, let's say you take uh, this, you take a shovel, and the bit of mass at this location, um, you doggedly distribute it uh, according to you know where the target distribution wants it. Um, so. If I if I cut across this uh, um, distribution here, I, I find just the thing at the top, yeah, and vice versa. So and now I mixed up source and target, um, but you take a little bit of dirt from the source and you distribute it perfectly according to where the target wants it but regardless of what you do with all the other. Yeah, so this is the stupid solution, but this one you reach in the limit of infinite temperature. Now, the number of iterations that you need depends on this temperature. Yeah? If you want to be really close to the, um, to the exact solution, you have to choose a small gamma, and you see that working with a small gamma is more expensive than working with a large gamma. Um, so the thing is fast as it is. It can be made faster still um, if in these matrix vector operations you don't use the full matrix and the full vector, but you subsample both. And how to do that is described, for example, in this paper here. Um, and it is also differentiable. Why? Because we, the entire way or to the solution is just you know a long series of matrix vector products, element-wise or, or in the conventional sense. And uh, such linear operations are something that you can formally you know write as a neural network. Um, is anyway, it's something that you can always differentiate through. So in summary, um, these synchron iterations are fast, they're differentiable, and they're approximate, which sometimes is good if you want this smoothness with respect to the cost. It's sometimes bad, uh, in particular if you care about getting sparse solutions out. Uh, you know, this is not what you get here. You get uh, these dense solutions. Um, but this is a very nice solver for discrete optimal transport. And again, the reference for um, uh, this work is here. But it's also very nicely described in this book by uh, Perret and Couturi, which you find in the literature.